good morning or good evening if there are people from outside the MENA region. I'd like to bring warm greetings from Apache, the Asia Pacific Association of Allergy, Asthma and Clinical Immunology to all our colleagues in the MENA region and to people who are logging in from other regions of the world. Uh, this special series of Apache MENA uh, are focused on specific topics that will bring to you the cutting edge in the science as well as the clinical uh, aspects of the different diseases that we will present to you. The first of this series, Apache MENA Allergy Series 2021, is on an update on CRS and airways disease, as well as the environment. And we have with us, uh, along with me, Professor Klaus Bahad and Professor Lu Zhang from uh, China and Professor Bahad from Belgium, who will join uh, me in this session. I'd briefly like to just say a few words about myself. Uh, I, I know many of you know me. I have been closely associated with the MENA region. It's like a second home for me. Uh, many of you are like close friends uh, of mine. Uh, I am at the Nippon Medical School heading uh, the allergy division in the Department of Pediatrics. I'm currently the president of the Asia Pacific Association of Allergy, Asthma and Clinical Immunology. And I'm the past president of the World Allergy Organization for which I worked 17 years and was president 2012 and 2013. Uh, I also have received several recognitions, but my main research interests are on the cellular and molecular mechanisms of allergy, environmental pollutants, epithelial immune cell interactions, novel therapies of allergy, the microbiome, food allergies, and biomarkers of asthma. Uh, my publications are uh, over 590 with an H index of 77 and a citation of about 38,000. It is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Klaus Bach. His is a name that doesn't need an introduction. He is so well known. And for me, most importantly, he's been a friend of mine and close colleague of mine for over 25 years. Professor Klaus Bahad heads the Upper Airways Research Lab and is chief of the clinics at the ENT department, University Hospital in Ghent, Belgium. He has uh, done his training from Heidelberg in Germany, and he's trained as an ENT as well as allergology, allergologist. And he's also a visiting professor at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, which is a very, very prestigious position. He has so many publications to his credit, and he's on the, on the board of several global guidelines, some of which we are together in, like the AREA, but he's also part of the EPOS guidelines, and he has served, of course, in the Yaki board, but it was my privilege to have him on the WOW board during my tenure uh, in WOW. He's also president of the German Society of Allergology, and he has numerous scientific publications and is highly cited and an editor of Jackie, uh, one of the top two journals uh, in the field of allergy. He will now talk to us about the endotypes of chronic rhinosinusitis and biologics. So Klaus, please. Hello, good morning, good evening, dear friends. It's about uh, endotypes of chronic rhinosinusitis and biologics I want to talk to you today. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm uh, Professor Klaus Bachet from Ghent University. I also work in the Karinska Institute and the Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou. Chronic rhinosinusitis is currently divided into two um, phenotypes, as we call it. One is chronic rhinosinusitis without, and the other is with nasal polyps. Just dependent on whether you see or do not see nasal polyps in the nose, mostly by nasal endoscopy. However, there is something beyond this um, phenotype, and this is actually the inflammation, specifically 
the endotype of this inflammation. We have learned in the last decades that this endotype and endotyping is very decisive because it helps us to predict the future of this patient, the prognosis of this patient, and it also helps us to decide on the right treatment for that patient. Specifically in patients with nasal polyps, we have learned that this treatment can be very laborious and uh, several surgeries, several oral steroid courses are necessary during the 30, 40 years the patient actually suffers from this disease. So it is very good, very important to change something on our approach to this disease. Understanding it is the first step we have to do to adjust our treatment approaches and to integrate, and this is my topic today, maybe new treatment approaches, including biologic treatment. What you see here is a nice Italian publication looking at a typical patient with several surgeries over the years and quite um, fastly following one to each other, but also other treatments in between. And the patient still is lacking control of disease. So one thing we could change is, of course, the standard of treatment, which includes um, surgery and which includes mostly oral glucocorticosteroids. We are very careful with oral glucocorticosteroids. And remember, in these patients with comorbid asthma, for example, you very often also have um, other doctors uh, giving corticosteroids to that patient, adding up to the burden of treatment rather than the burden of disease. The other possibility is, of course, surgery and standard of care possibility is, of course, surgery. And also here we have worked on a, a um, change in the technique in the sense of that the surgery you have to apply here is not the classical ventilation and drainage um, surgery. The endoscopic sinus surgery, or sometimes called functional endoscopic sinus surgery, which actually aims to restore ventilation and drainage. Here we have a mucosal disease. If we wanna change anything on this mucosal disease, we have to take away the sinus mucosa not the nasal mucosa, so no need to cut turbinates, but there is um, sinus mucosa, which is able to produce nasal polyps, to form nasal polyps, and has this severe type two inflammation. And that's the mucosa we could remove, and we have described that as a so-called reboot uh, approach. This is how it looks at the end of the surgery, and you see in this, slide here. Uh, for example, the denuded wall, posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, we look into the etmoid here, the roof of the maxillary sinus. And after just four weeks, this is very nicely healed and uh, closed again. There's a new mucosa, which does not show the possibility of forming nasal polyps. And this is after two years of the same patient. So when we go beyond classical uh, approaches, such as steroids, which we want to avoid, and surgery, which we want to adjust, uh, to something new like biologics, we do have to understand more about the endotypes. Not what we see in the nose, but what is the inflammation underlying this, um, um, this disease. And here we, we have learned that um, there are type two and non-type two disease. Type two actually describes a situation where we have upregulation of interleukin four, five, and 13, IgE and eosinophil. So it's an eosinophilic IgE positive type two immune reaction, which is very typical for, as we see here, chronic rhinosinusitis without, but also 
with nasal polyps. About 50% of CRS without nasal polyps is type 2, and about 85% in our country of nasal polyps is type 2. And even within this type 2, we have a moderate and we have a severe um, uh, expression. And specifically in the severe expression, we have a high asthma comorbidity, 50 to 70%, and we have a very high likelihood also of recurrence after conventional endoscopic sinus surgery. So we have specifically for these patients to consider the background, the inflammation. And this is what you see here depicted, type two immune responses in chronic rhinosinusitis, beginning at the nasal epithelium, translating into a activation of innate lymphocytes, dendritic cells, that then activate the T cells. And this ends up in the activation of either the eosinophil, and you see here the typical charcoal crystals, modifying, amplifying the immune response and the production of IgE and other immunoglobulins by B cells um, via the uh, activation of B cells or what we uh, recently also described in nasal mucosa, uh, marginal, marginal zone B1 cells. This leads to the production of uh, cytokines, the T cell activation, the ILC activation, but also of IgE, which we can then measure, and the activation of ESNF. How can we approach this um, disease by biologics, innovative biologics? And that's a development um, starting in 2006 with the first study on Restlizumab in RTL5. Uh, antibody which is not uh, further developed, mepolizumab in 2011, omalizumab 2012, and finally dupilumab in the 2018 and 19 trials. At the moment, we have two drugs, and there is a, a third one recently, uh, mepolizumab, um, which have shown in phase three trials that they are efficacious, and two of these drugs already are registered from the FDA and the EMA. And there's more development to come. Even new drugs will be developed targeting other um, uh, cytokines or mediators in the nasal polyps. So this is a very uh, great development over the last 15 years. And as you can see here, the first publications um, were uh, actually coming from Ghent, uh, trying to figure out whether we can, as we have understood the disease better, uh, target those uh, cytokines and make a difference for the patient. And actually we can. Um, the antibodies, benralizumab, uh, mepolizumab, target the eosinophil, the IL-5 and IL-5 receptor alpha regulation. Omalizumab targets IgE and with that the mast cells and basophils, but of course also secondary processes due to the degranulation of mast cells and basophils. And finally, dupilumab charges the interleukin-4 receptor alpha, and that um, will lead to um, the um, uh, uh, shutting down of the effects of IL-4 and IL-13. This is um, the sinus-24 and sinus-52. Uh, trials, actually two large trials in more than 700 patients, who actually showed that over 24 weeks and 52 weeks, there is a highly significant change in different parameters in those patients uh, with chronic rhinosinusitis, with nasal polyps, um, with or without asthma. And we will come shortly to that later. All of these patients were treated with mometasone as a baseline. Um, and had either placebo or dupilumab on top of it. Patients were uh, pretreated. All of these pre patients had corticosteroids before and or nasal surgery, and they were um, receiving topical steroids throughout the study, also in the placebo. Those patients had uh, nasal polyps over a decade. Uh, most of them had previous sinus surgery. Um, 
nearly 60% of those patients also had comorbid asthma. You can see that their SNOP score, which is telling you about quality of life, um, was clearly um, uh, impacted. The results of this study have been published in The Lancet in 2019, and they show that there is a clear decrease in the nasal polyp score. You see the upper panel A uh, for 24 weeks and 52 weeks. If you stop the treatment after 24 weeks, the nasal polyps tend to come back, not to baseline, but still they tend to come back. If you continue the treatment over 24 weeks, you have an additional effect. And this additional effect on the nasal polyps, nasal polyp score, also translates into reduction of symptoms, such here, nasal deep congestion and obstruction. You also can see that. Um, nasal congestion as a symptom um, also shows some change just with placebo. This is a typical placebo effect, which you do not see in the nasal polyp score, which is sort of is a um, externally validated uh, nasal polyp score based on a video in each individual patient and each visit. Very impressive for the patients is the regaining of this possibility to smell. And as you see on the right side, the um, upset as a test for smell shows a steep and enormously fast um, uh, recovery. So most of these patients were actually anosmic and they recovered their sense of smell just in four to eight weeks and then plateaued over the time. That means they, they didn't lose it again uh, over the whole study period. And after the study, of course, uh, smell uh, slightly dis, um, uh, um, dysregulated. So the smell is one of the first symptoms also. The patients came spontaneously reporting to us, I can smell again since five years, which was a <clears throat> very happy, um, event for the patient and, and of course also for us. We can also follow this in the CT scan and you see from left to the right, January 2017 to 2018, really a clearing up of all of the tissue. This is not in all the patients. Uh, this we see in about 15% of the patients that without any further intervention, neither surgery nor steroids, the polyps totally clear up. In total, there's about a two thirds of the patients responding to the drug, but not all of them responding with a total um, uh, reduction of their nasal polyps. What they do spare is of course, further interventions such as systemic corticosteroids and or surgery. And there was a reduction in the proportion of patients requiring systemic steroids of about 75%. And of those require nasal polyp surgery of about 90%. At the same time, there were really not um, any uh, scaring uh, adverse events. So the drug was quite tolerable over the time. There were some injection site reactions. Um, and I think it's very important to to guide the patient and to train the patient how to inject because this is a self-injection over the time. Um, and there was a little bit of issue with uh, conjunctivitis and you might have to involve an ophthalmologist. Then. Other principles of uh, treatment are anti-IgE, the omalizumab, and anti-R5 or anti-R5 receptor alpha. And I will just shortly show you some studies um, that have uh, recently been uh, published, and these are again phase three studies in a great number of patients. This here shows the omalizumab efficacy through week 24. Um, and what you see on the left side is again the nasal polyp score reduction. Um, you see a significant and also fast in four to eight weeks reduction of the nasal polyp score and the leveling out over the rest of the treatment period. That as you can
can see on the right side, translates again into uh, less nasal congestion. However, the change from uh, baseline was not as pronounced as it was with dupilumab. Also, this drug is very well tolerable. Um, injection site reactions is uh, the only thing where we see a certain difference between those treated and those not treated with uh, Vero. There has recently been a open label extension study showing that this uh, effect of omolizumab in the first uh, 24 weeks can be maintained by further applying the drug and even can be, um, uh, yeah, there can be some reduction of nasal polyp score added over time. However, even if you stop after one year, there will be a um, regression to the former baseline value. And finally, we have a study with uh, mepolisumab, an anti-R5 receptor, an anti-R5 uh, uh, antagonist, uh, which was also performed uh, in a phase Trial, phase three trial internationally um, with more or less uh, similar selection of patients. Here, all the patients had at least one former uh, surgery. And as you can see here again, there's about a 50% reduction um, to the drug in terms of uh, reduction of nasal polyp score. Um, and this is and, uh, uh, nasal uh, congestion or VAS score. Um, and again, there are some non-responders um, and 50% uh, reduction over this time of, in that case, 52 weeks. So the drug seems to be somewhat slower um, and the optimal, or the uh, maximum effect is um, somewhat lower than with dupilumab. However, here again, there was a reduction in the need of nasal surgery um, and the drug was uh, well tolerable. So when we take all this together um, and we try to understand in whom should we actually use in whom should we actually use uh, these medications, then it is very clear that it should be only in patients with severe nasal polyps, meaning that they would have a nasal polyp score of four or more. Um, and that is, of course, before any other in intervention, such as surgery. And I will come to that in a moment. At the same moment, the patients should be symptomatic. And that means there is normally loss of smell and there should be a loss of smell score above two or a uh, nasal congestion score above two points out of three. So they are symptomatic and have nasal polyps both sides and at least a score of four. And there are uncontrolled to the standard of care, which means uh, at least one cause of systemic corticosteroids in the preceding two years and or previous nasal surgery. In those patients, you could then select certain biologics, and it's not quite clear um, uh, whether there are specific patients responding to one of these biologics are better than to other biologics. How do you treat then these patients? And there is something we still have to consider out in the, uh, to figure out in the future. If they um, um, fulfill the criteria, so they have severe nasal polyposis, lack of control, they might have been comorbid, have uh, suffering from comorbidities such as asthma, and they are likely type two in our place, uh, this is anyway likely, um, then we should look at the um, possibilities together with the patient and either decide classically on surgery or on biologics. If we go for a next 
10 year treatment. And that is the purpose of this, not just you know, over the next half year, but how do we control this disease uh, of this patient for the next decade? Then we should consider that to start with a biologic has a lot of advantages. First, it is really um, a treatment that can then be controlled um, by looking at the polyps and seeing that there is a reaction to the drug. And you need to have the reaction to the biologic. Otherwise, it's not justified to treat patients over months and years without knowing that the patient reacts as a responder to the treatment. That means that you still have to have polyps. So to do a surgery first would be contraproductive. On the other hand, with a biologic, you create, if a surgery is still necessary, a situation in which the surgery can be done under the protection of the biologic. Um, and we have done that in several cases. And you can clearly see the surgery gets less bloody, the wound healing gets much better. So the, for the order of, concert, of sequence uh, for these events would always be in my eyes. First, the biologic see that it works, only then you continue. If it works and it's necessary to do a surgery after six months, 12 months, you can do that under the protection of the biologic and continue with the biologic treatment. I do hope that with this approach, we can um, create a better long-term condition for the patient with this uh, very humbling uh, chronic disease. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Barat Klaus, for this excellent lecture, um, uh, giving such an excellent overview of the phenotypes, uh, especially from the treatment point of view also. Um, it's, it's so interesting to see the evolution of treatment um, for chronic rhinosinusitis. I mean, you were uh, one of the leads who actually talked about the phenotypes and endotypes of chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyps in the world. And today we come to precision medicine targeting these different phenotypes. And, uh, and I know, of, of course, your work along with uh, uh, Professor Dujang uh, in Asia, look, comparing Chinese and uh, uh, Western nasal polyps. So. What I'd really like to ask you um, as a start is when we talk about these different biologics, do we have like something specific for the neutrophilic type of nasal polyps uh, or what we are talking about now are more towards the eosinophilic type of nasal polyps? And the other thing is that uh, as we have also seen, and I also can say from 30 years back when most of our uh, polyps were just neutrophilic. You can see the change that has occurred in Asia, that there is so much more eosinophilic polyps uh, than neutrophilic polyps. Absolutely, Ruby. Thank you for the questions. Um, clearly, what we see is uh, that there is worldwide uh, not only an increase, obviously, in the eosinophilic nasal polyps, which in our countries about 80 to 85% of our patients. And with that, I mean patients with uncontrolled severe chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, but we also see that the severity of this eosinophilic inflammation actually increases. We have higher IL-5 values, ECP values, and other mediators. Um, so far, all these antibodies target type 2 immune reactions. And of course, these antibodies have not been developed for nasal polyps. That would be very prestigious for the ENT. It's rather developed for asthma. And uh, of course, there again, it's type 2 in the first place. I would say that most probably, as I said before, type 2 is causing uh, recurrence, type 2 is uh, causing comorbid asthma, so it's a good part of it, or it's a good target uh, out of type 2 or non-type 2. I would also choose type 2 today uh, as a target for those treatments. And of course, we also have to understand that this is not a treatment for everybody. 
there are certain um, rules. Uh, of course, we have our classical pathways and our classical treatment methods, which we should not forget. It's not that from now on or, or everybody is treated with a monoclonal antibody. Um, but of course, we will see, and uh, there is currently already development, uh, also other drugs uh, coming for the more neutrophilic type of polyposis maybe, and maybe even CRS without nasal polyps. Uh, I think that is the next target that we will see. Um, as you said correctly, 50% of those patients are already uh, type 2, and 50% uh, are not. And most probably these patients being actually more patients than the nasal polyp patients, this is a logic uh, next target. We do still have a little bit of problems uh, of diagnosing some. For nasal polyps, it's very simple. Um, if they are nasal polyps with comorbid asthma, it's type 2. If there are nasal polyps without comorbid asthma, but increased ears and fills, it's also type 2. So that is very simple. In Sierras without nasal polyps, uh, it's much more complicated. We might make have to use... Uh, uh, biomarkers, uh, which we haven't figured out uh, solidly now. So that needs to wait a little bit, but I do see a future or an extension of biologic use in CRS in the future. Thank you very much. That was really brilliantly expressed and explained. Uh, I think everybody who is attending um, has uh, learned a lot from the talk and from uh, your answer. We will have more opportunities to have a discussion, a panel discussion and questions from the audience at a later stage. So for want of time, uh, thank you very much, uh, Klaus, and we will move forward to the next speaker. It was a great pleasure also to see you again. Yes, likewise. See you soon Bye. again. Bye. See you soon. It is now my pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Lu Zhang, uh, who is professor at the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and Department of Allergy, Beijing Tongren Hospital, Capital Medical University. Professor Lu Zhang is a Zhang Zhang Scholar Program Professor at the Capital Medical University in Beijing, China, and Director of the Beijing Institute of Otolaryngology and Executive President of the Beijing Tongren Hospital. And this is extremely prestigious position. Over the last decade, he has published a lot of papers in the space of chronic rhinosinusitis, CD reactivity, allergen immunotherapy, and surgical techniques of ESS. He's very well known, very young, very active, um, on the editorial board of many journals, has published over 163 papers, and has received top scientific awards in China, like the National Outstanding Science Prize in 2010. I also had the wonderful pleasure of working with him on the WOW board during my presidency and prior uh, and after my presidency uh, in WOW. And I'm currently uh, also very privileged to have him as the treasurer of Apache uh, in our board as very, very active uh, uh, executive committee member. So, and he's also the past president of the Chinese Society of Allergology. Uh, we had our very excellent meeting in 2019, which was hosted by him in Beijing. So welcome, uh, uh, Professor Lu Zhang, to talk on chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, East versus West phenotypes, and the EPOS guideline 2020. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Zhang Luo. I'm an ENT surgeon with Beijing Tongren Hospital and Beijing Institute of Otolaryngology. First of all, I would like to thank Ruby for inviting me to attend Apache Manor for the first time. I will talk about the phenotypes of CRS with nasal polyps, focusing on how that influences our daily practice. Some of the information is based on the EPOS 2020 documents, which is important for both doctors and researchers in the area. 
in the review we published several years ago, we drew this world map to show the current prevalence of CRS in the world. As you can see, chronic rhinosinusitis is prevalent in 8 to 11 percent of adults in Europe, 5 to 12 percent in North America and Brazil. The prevalence of CRS in China is 8 percent, which is close to the neighboring country Korea. So worldwidely, CRS is a very common disease. As you all know, EPOS 2020 phenotypically divides CRS into two types, CRS with nasopolyps and CRS without nasopolyps. I'm going to focus on CRS with nasopolyps. These are apples I usually eat in Beijing. You may eat different apples like these. We can tell the difference from the appearance of different kinds of apples. However, for nasal polyps, it may not be that easy. Here is a Chinese polyp. Do all the polyps in the world look the same? I suppose they do. We published a multicenter study in 2016 demonstrating the diversity of inflammatory patterns of CRS with nasal polyps in the world. We collect samples from China, Japan, Europe, and Australia, and we mirrored different cytokines in polyps. This figure summarizes the cytokine expression in polyps from different regions. Generally speaking, these results indicate that polyps from Europe are closely related to L5, which is a T2 dominant pattern. The single L5 positivity is lowest in China, and the total L5 positivity in Beijing is close to Japan and Australia consisting of a mainly T2, T1, or T2, T17 mixed patterns. So the polyps from different regions may look the same. They are actually different in terms of inflammatory patterns. In history, nasal polyps was believed to be a more like a unified disease with common histological characteristics. It was reported that most polyps were characterized by a Th2 inflammatory pattern involving cytokines L4, L5, L13, and IgE. One of the most common pathological features of polyps was eosinophilia, as described in this classic rhinology textbook. This is a classic pathological classification of polyps proposed by Hillquist more than 20 years ago. The most common type is the Demeter's eosinophilic type, 86%. Actually, a few studies showed that eosinophilic infiltration was extremely common in nasal polyps, being presented in more than 76% of the European and American patients. However, polyps from Asia are different. Previous studies have demonstrated that the cellular composition of nasal polyps in Asia differs from that in Western patients. For example, in Japan, as early as 1980s, only 60% of a large cereal showed prominent eosinophilic pattern of inflammation. After that, two studies reported similar percentages. The other two studies reported lower percentages, only 32 and 36%. Percentages of eosinophilic inflammation were also reported in Korea, 
32%, 36%, and 63%. Malaysia, 51%, Singapore, 63%, and Thailand, only 18%, which is astonishing. Now, we all may have the impression that eosinophilic nasal polyps were less common in Asia. However, before we make a conclusion on that, we need to realize that the previous results were based on variable definitions of eosinophilic polyps. The definition of eosinophilic CRS with polyps is not standardized. In a review published three years ago in IFAR, we have summarized the current criteria for eosinophilic CRS with nasal polyps. This table shows the tissue eosinophilic number per hyper field, which are used as cutoff values varying from 5 to 350 per hyper field. Regarding the tissue eosinophil percentage, the cutoff values vary from 5% to 50%. These results suggest that the cutoff values of eosinophils as the diagnostic criteria of eosinophilic CRS wisdom of polyps are subject to change with geographic and ethnic differences. Importantly, within the last three decades, there are evidence from Thailand, Korea, and China showing the polyps in Asia seem to be more eosinophilic. That indicates the inflammatory pattern may change over time. The study from Thailand reported that over a period of 12 years, there was a seven-fold increase in tissue eosinophil number. The study from Korea reported over a period of 17 years, the proportions of eosinophilic polyps doubled, increasing from 24% to 51%. Actually, studies from China reported very similar results. In Wuhan, over 14 years, the eosinophilic percentage increased from 16% to 44%. While in Beijing, over 11 years, the eosinophilic percentage increased from 59% to 74%. We published a multi-center study recently. As you can see, that over a period of 20 to 30 years, the percentage of eosinophil dominant polyps increased from 9% to 32%. And this endotype is known to be associated with higher asthma mobility and recurrence. Not surprisingly, the rate of comorbid asthma in 2015 group, 35%, which was higher than that in 1993 group, only 2%. As was the rate of polyps recurrence, 55% versus 35%. 31 years ago, Dr. Stamberger reported a recurrence rate of 18% in a large series of patients with nasal polyps. In 2017, a multi-center study from North American reported that the recurrence of six months after surgery is 
35%, and the rate increased to 40% 18 months after surgery. So the recurrence of the surgery is common, and we need to know the risk factors of that. You are looking at the EPOS definition of CRS based on the symptoms, endoscopic signs, and or CT changes. We commonly use endoscopic center surgery to treat the patients with polyps. A major limitation in the current surgical management is the absence of clinically relevant biomarkers for treatment selection. We want to use observable features to predict the outcome of the treatment by phenotypically classifying the patients with polyps. As a surgeon, I'm operating on nasal polyps all the time. You are looking at two patients with nasal polyps who have both received appropriate medical treatments and endoscopic sinus surgeries. The pre-operative CT scans and the post-operative images. Well, one group of patients, like the first female patients, shows very good response to surgery. The other group of patients, like the male patient, shows recurrence. These patients have been classified as refractory or difficult patients. The question here is, among so many factors which may cause the difference, what are the most causative factor? If we can find that factor, can we then predict the outcome of the surgical treatment? We have successfully linked the inflammatory patterns of polyps with the surgical outcome by using cluster analysis. In the retrospective study, we recruited 366 patients with polyps who received endoscopic sinus surgery and appropriate uh, medical treatment. With the mean follow-up of uh, nearly three years, it was surprising to find out that the recurrence rate was as high as 57%. Then we did hierarchical clustering of four mucosa inflammatory cell percentages. There are five clusters displaying different inflammatory patterns. It is interesting to find out that the follow-up result of these five clusters are quite different, ranging from 6% to 99%. Almost all the patients in cluster 5, which is characterized by eosinophil, will have a recurrence in response to surgical treatment. We classified polyps into this cluster when the percentages of eosinophils in tissue is more than 55%. In clinic, these are really difficult patients. Here we go back to the previous cases to show the result of tissue biopsy. The uppercase without recurrence shows a tissue eosinophil number of 30, which is lower than the cutoff value of 55, and the percentages is 22%, which is also lower than the cutoff value of 27%. The lower case with recurrence shows a tissue eosinophil number of 300 and the percentages of 58%, both higher than the cutoff value respectively. Actually, we have to do 
revision surgery to this patient. The biopsy, the biopsy shows again higher value of two tissue eosinophil biomarkers, indicating a high chance of recurrence later. You are looking at a multicenter study from Japan, also reported that the tissue eosinophil number was correlated with recurrence and a cutoff number of 70 showed the most significant difference. Meanwhile, in a meta-analysis study published several years ago, the authors totally identified 11 papers with uh, seven cutoff values that reported high tissue eosinophilia associated with recurrence. And they found a cutoff value of 55 per hepar field, which was reported by our group, show the highest sensitivity and specificity. Therefore, 55 per hepar field is recommended for predicting the likelihood of recurrence. In the paper we published last year in Rhinology, we investigated the long-term outcomes of different surgical strategies for patients with nasal polyps and asthma. Patients were randomly assigned to receive the FAS, radical FAS, or radical FAS plus draft 3. Although radical FAS and draft 3 strategies yield better short-term outcomes than did FAS, the recurrence rate is 96% in all three groups at time of five years after surgery. This study demonstrated that patients with nasal polyps and asthma have poor outcomes after extended surgeries. Despite adequate surgery and maximum medical therapy, some patients continue to suffer from persistent and controlled symptoms. Fortunately, nowadays we have biologics, which is opening new perspectives for those patients with difficult CRS with nasal polyps. In two reviews we published in 2019, we have summarized the proof of concept trials with several biologics in nasal polyps, which revealed an innovative therapeutic potential. Currently, there are three biologics, duplimab, omelizumab, and mepolizumab, which have finished the phase three clinical trials. They are shown to be effective and safe in the treatment of refractory CRS with nipple polyps. Among them, duplimab and omelizumab have got regulatory approval in the US and Europe. Here is a case showing the effect of biological treatment. This male patient with nasal polyps and asthma had three endoscopic center surgeries. The last one is radical FAS with draft 3 procedure. And as you can see, mucosa edema after oral steroid and macrolide treatment. However, after four months treatment with biologic, the mucosa was seen to be normal. You are looking at the integrated diagnosis treatment algorithms for chronic rhinosinusitis, which we published two years ago. Current management algorithms are unable to achieve and maintain optimal disease control, especially in clusters with high eosinophilia. The identification of patient subset and effective biomarkers is important for optimizing biotherapeutic strategies. These are my colleagues who have contributed to the study. I would like to thank our collaborators at Ghent University, Klaus and Nan as well. And I thank you for your attention. And I think there's so many takeaway um, 
uh, messages and to so many takeaway uh, key points, both from your talk and um, uh, Klaus's talk. So it's, it's so interesting to see how um, things have changed from uh, moving on from the traditional surgery alone or surgery and uh, pharmacotherapy um, and, and the type of uh, pattern of nasal polyps in our region. So could you just throw some light on uh, this changing profile of neutrophilic to eosinophilic uh, polyps? Uh, what do you think could be the reason why this kind of change is occurring in our region? Well, thank you, Ruby, for this uh, wonderful question. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion on the reason, reason for that. Uh, basically, uh, there are two sides of the uh, questions. Maybe uh, 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 the, the environmental uh, uh, situation uh, or the genetic uh, influence on this issue. However, since the uh, change happened so fast, we basically rule out the, 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 the effect of uh, genetic parts. Uh, currently, uh, we uh, focus on the uh, uh, living styles, uh, diet, and uh, the, the environmental uh, factors, which may have influence on that uh, change. Ruby. Thank you very much. There, there is some data talking about uh, probiotics being uh, by Susan Lynch, um, uh, talking about the use of probiotics in chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, do you have some kind of uh, uh, protocol in China using probiotics or any such kind of treatments? Uh, definitely, they are increasing uh, evidence showing uh, uh, the probiotics may have uh, effect on the treatment of uh, CRS with nasal polyps or without nasal polyps. However, uh, I think we need more evidence to put on into the uh, guideline. Actually, in China, we don't use probiotics uh, uh, currently. I know there's uh, uh, there are some uh, researchers and doctors uh, supporting to use that in Japan. I, I think it start actually the research started from Japan. I know uh, Dr. Cheng Lei from China, he studied in, in Japan and he is one of the few guys in China who in favor of uh, using that. But uh, uh, basically in, in clinic in, now in China, we don't use that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, the other uh, point I had uh, was asking is that when we talk about uh, uh, using biologics um, uh, in chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, what is the period that you can see uh, uh, like uh, a reduction in their recurrence? For how long can we actually uh, see that? Um, and and. Uh, because after we treat them, how long are they symptom-free? How, the, how long can the disease be under control? And when do we have to restart the treatment? Well, that's a very uh, uh, useful uh, question for clinical doctors, I, I, I have to say. I mean, uh, based on the literature, the period of treat, uh, biologic treatment varied from 24 weeks to 52 weeks, which means the, the, the long, longest time of using that is uh, one year. We don't have experience longer than one year. Uh, on the other side, uh, we need to uh, give some time to the effect of biologics. Usually in clinic, we uh, uh, observe the patients for the first eight to 12 weeks to see if they have some, at least uh, some effects. Because uh, uh, you know that's biologic treatment is expensive. If uh, longer than two or three months we don't see any clinical effects, the patient will not continue uh, to use that. So I think three months in clinic we have to see some effect. That response rate is around sixty percent to sixty percent, I think, to seventy percent. Sorry. 
Thank you. There's one more question I'd like to ask before you know we have a discussion from the audiences. You are an expert also in allergen immunotherapy, and so uh, there are patients who have allergic rhinitis uh, and then land up also with chronic rhinosinusitis. So for these patients, um, if they are on allergen immunotherapy, um, do you uh, advise uh, the use of biologics uh, along with uh, the allergen immunotherapy? Is there any uh, contraindication for it or is it okay to give it? Well, it, that's a very, uh, another uh, wonderful question I have to say. I mean, uh, as you, you can see, uh, biologics treatment, usually we give uh, the patients uh, every month. Um, I mean, uh, at the same time, we usually give the, uh, if the patient have a, a immunotherapy for allergic rhinitis, they also got the treatment uh, every two or three months. So we can uh, divide this two uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, very carefully. I mean, uh, we don't give the uh, treatment at the same time, that's for sure. We can, uh, you know, every uh, uh, two, three weeks, we can uh, just alternatively give the two uh, uh, treatment. Thank you very much. So um, uh, thank you very much, Professor Lu Zhang, and uh, it was a wonderful talk and thanks for the questions. We'll have questions from the audience and also the panel discussion at the end of uh, our three talks. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to start my talk and uh, um, I'm taking you a little bit away from chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyps. We've had two excellent talks on chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyps, but also we have to realize that these are all part of an airways disease, asthma and allergic rhinitis and otitis media with effusion. So uh, all these are interplay and uh, coexist also with each other. And of course, I mean, they are also related with other diseases like atopic dermatitis and food allergies too, because allergic rhinitis is often uh, uh, a cause or one of the triggers of the, uh, in case of pollen fruit allergy syndrome or oral allergy syndrome, where there's a cross reactivity between the pollen and the food uh, component uh, uh, of the fruit or the vegetable leading to severe symptoms and even anaphylaxis. So they're all interrelated uh, in a way. What I'm going to talk to you about is about the impact of air pollution on allergic airways disease. So I have no disclosures. The objectives are here uh, as uh, uh, you can see it later. I just like to in uh, introduce by saying that allergic diseases have been increasing worldwide to epidemic proportions. And we know that 300 million people suffer from asthma, 400 million people from allergic rhinitis. And there are other uh, airways diseases besides allergic diseases like COPD or ACOS, which are also affected and chronic rhinosinusitis, which are also affected by air pollution. And then there are environmental determinants of allergy and asthma, like early in the early life, which could include the host and environmental microbiome, the air pollution and climate change. And then primary prevention efforts are always guided by the study of the exposome or collective environmental exposures in the prenatal period to identify modifiable uh, uh, risks uh, for allergic disease. Now, some of the factors that are associated with epigenetic effects includes pollutants like indoor and outdoor, I will come to it later, but say, for example, cigarette smoking, diesel exhaust particles, organic uh, pollutants, uh, microbial exposure in utero, uh, these are done through animal and human studies, dietary factors like folate, uh, also playing an important role uh, in uh, disease development of allergic disease. 
Now let's look at the air pollutants. When we look at the air pollutants, there are actually uh, different types of air pollutants, the outdoor pollutants, which can be gaseous or particulate matter. The gaseous ones are primary or secondary, which are like NO2, SO2, carbon monoxide, CO2, and vol uh, volatile organic compounds. And then we have ozone. And then you have particulate mat matter like ground transportation, stubs, industry, and atmospheric oxidation, as well as the PM 2.5, PM 0.1, or PM 10. So we all know that these air pollutants, and there's plenty of studies to show how they actually uh, affect the uh, allergic airways disease, but I'll just give you a quick overview on it. When airborne pollutants actually adhere to the pollen, they actually increase their irritant properties and increase their ability to cause allergies. And basically they increase their allergenicity and make them more uh, um, uh, easy to cause allergic symptoms in patients with allergic diseases. When we look at the different effects of uh, um, air pollution, one is the trap, that is this traffic related air pollution on allergic disease. Now this was done in um, Korea, but there are studies in Mexico and several uh, other parts of the world uh, showing similar data where air pollution has an impact or traffic related air pollution has an impact on allergic uh, airways disease. Now, if you look at this uh, part of uh, the uh, abstract, you can see over here very clearly, it talks about uh, diagnosed asthma or uh, symptoms uh, ever uh, or treated allergic rhinitis uh, or um, the lung function, uh, the uh, asthma as such, uh, all these different factors. And they looked at the length of the, uh, or the distance from the main road and uh, the home. So that basically what they showed in the studies that, that living less than um, living less than 75 meters from the main road was significantly associated with lifetime allergic rhinitis, past AR symptoms, diagnosed AR, treated AR, and also in a reduction in the lung function uh, tests. So very clearly showing that trap had a negative impact on airway allergies. This is actually done, uh, uh, it's basically a video questionnaire and there are several other studies also done, but I'm just showing you for want of time, just this uh, study where they looked at the rural versus urban Beijing and the asthma symptoms past 12 months. And they looked at the wheeze attack, the exercise induced wheeze and severe wheezing attack. And all these parameters were more in the urban area than in the rural area and were statistically significant, clearly showing that the um, air pollution here was impacting and causing this increased wheeze attack, exercise induced asthma or severe wheezing attack. Another study looking at gestational and early life exposure to ambient NO2R as risk factors for childhood respiratory disease this is looking at a large study of 3,358 preschool children who did not alter their residences. So when you move residences, well, that could impact the you know, level of pollution, but these are, they did not alter residences after birth from a cross-section study in 2011 to 2012 in Shanghai, China. And then you can see here that the daily concentration of SO2, nitrogen oxide, uh, dioxide, and PM uh, particulate matter within an aerodynamic diameter of like PM10 during the child's total lifetime for each district where the children live were actually measured, the daily concentration. And what they concluded from the study is that the exposure to NO2 in the first year of life was significantly associated with asthma. Exposure to NO2 even during gestation and the one to three years of life and overall total lifetime was all associated with increased odds of allergic rhinitis, very clearly showing about the impact of air pollution. I'll take you to another uh, different aspect of uh, what air pollution or climate change can cause, more of climate change, I would say. So we have heard, I'm sure, of thunderstorm asthma. And in your area, you have sandstorms, and uh, that, again, is a huge uh, a way of uh, actually aggravating the symptoms of rhinitis or asthma. 
But thunderstorm asthma has been reported in different parts of the world, first reported in Birmingham, UK, and then in Canada, USA, Italy, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and more recently uh, in 2016 in uh, Melbourne. So this is the Melbourne epidemic uh, thunderstorm asthma that actually occurred in 2016. And what exactly happens here? Normally, as you know, pollen grains are quite big. They cannot enter into the airways because they are too large to enter the nasal mucosa or the lower respiratory tract. But what happens in thunderstorm asthma is these pollen grains are swept up into the cloud uh, as the storm matures. And once they are swept up into the clouds, they, the moisture in the cloud actually fragments the pollen into smaller particles and then these smaller particles gradually come down. The dry, cold outflows will carry these pollen fragments to the ground level. And these pollen particles are at the size of 2.5 micrometer. So when they are at this size of this 2.5 micrometer, the rainwater will rupture the ryegrass pool, releasing the fine allergen-bearing starch granules, which are then breathed by the people who are moving around outside uh, during this thunderstorm asthma, uh, thunderstorm period. So the basic factor is that you have thunderstorm and you have the pollen season at the same time. If there is no pollen season at that same time, this would not occur. But during a pollen season, if there is a thunderstorm uh, at that time, that actually leads to uh, uh, this thunderstorm uh, asthma. So these ultra-fine starch particles reach the smaller airways and then they cause an inflammation. And this you can see here, eosinophils uh, and IL-5 positive cells are significantly increased in those patients who are uh, asthmatic or suffering from seasonalogic rhinitis, but subject to the thunderstorm uh, uh, situation. And what were the risk factors for hospital admission in this thunderstorm asthma? The risk factors in this was the presence of current asthma, the ethnicity also was interesting because the people of Indian and South A and uh, Southeast Asian ethnicity and those who had rhinitis uh, were also um, uh, more uh, prone to develop this thunderstorm asthma. And in the emergency cohort also, what happened is that those who had current asthma, again, the ethnicity, and uh, largely were those who had rhinitis and probably uncontrolled rhinitis. And clearly showing the importance of controlling rhinitis as a way to protect yourself from this kind of a situation of a being, uh, being uh, susceptible to a thunderstorm asthma. And the odds ratio for hospital admission was of course, again, current asthma, recent asthma admissions, and Asian born in Australia. Now, coming to the other aspects of climate change, we also know that pollen allergy is frequently associated uh, with uh, air pollution and respiratory uh, and, and epidemiological studies have shown that urbanization and high levels of vehicular emissions, westernized lifestyle uh, are all associated with increased frequency of respiratory allergy. So what does climate change do to the aero allergens? So you have human activities, resulting in increased CO2, resulting in increased temperature. This results in increased amount of pollen, stronger allergenicity of pollen, as I already showed you in the earlier slides, increased germination rate, altered plant tree distribution, earlier start of the pollen season and longer pollen season. And when you look at the effect of the temperature and the CO2 levels on pollen production, again, you can see the higher the temperature, uh, the higher the CO2 levels and the higher are more are seen clearly in the urban areas. So the difference between the urban areas is there is a higher temperature, the more CO2, uh, higher CO2 levels. And of course, the average pollen count is also much more uh, in the urban area. Now, moving away from the outdoor air pollutants and climate change, let's look at some of the indoor air pollutants. Now, indoor air pollutants are also very important. And the sources can be cooking, combustion, particulate suspension, building materials, air conditioning and cleaning, smoking, heating, 
building materials like formaldehyde, which causes sick building syndrome and biologic agents. And the products are as uh, shown here can be the same kind of products, uh, of course, in addition, mold uh, byproducts or endotoxin. Now, this is a study done in uh, Kyushu, Okinawa Maternal and Child Study, and where they looked at the impact of actually uh, smoking in pregnant women. And what you can see here, I'd like you to focus on this part, that the evidence that current smoking or environmental tobacco smoke exposure actually increase the likelihood of these and the possibility of a positive association between ETS exposure and rhinoconjunctivitis was also seen in this study. What about house dust phthalates in relation to asthma and allergies in both children and adults? Now, again, you can see over here that house dust phthalates can actually lead to uh, different um, uh, 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 increase in the patient's symptoms of uh, allergic rhinitis or asthma. So level of seven phthalates were looked at in the floor dust, and multi-surface dust in 156 single family homes I were measured. And what they showed is that this, the levels of DMP, DHP, DIBP, and benzene uh, in the flow dust were associated with the prevalence of allergic rhinitis, conjunctivitis, and atopic dermatitis in children. And the children were more vulnerable to phthalate exposure while household flow dust than were adults. So this again is very crucial. Now, just like to highlight something about uh, air pollution in the COVID. This is a paper that we just recently published uh, as Apache um, in Allergy, which we are very happy and congratulate uh, the chief editor in chief, uh, Professor Chesmi Actis. Uh, as we just uh, have been informed, their impact factor is 13.146, making it the top uh, allergy journal in the world. So, hearty congratulations to the leadership of Professor Chesmi Actis. And this is of uh, the members uh, from the board and from the different countries in the Asia Pacific region that contributed to this study, which was basically a preliminary survey looking at the Asia Pacific perspectives. But what I'd like to show you out here is that when you look at the common comorbidities among confirmed patients, very unlike normal situations where in viral infections, asthma is a common comorbidity. Here you can see that uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, cardiac disease, COPD, and to some extent malignancy were the common comorbidities, whereas asthma and allergic diseases were hardly uh, comorbidities to this condition. And in this pattern of comorbidity of asthma not being a comorbidity of uh, uh, COVID-19 is also seen in Italy and other parts of the world, although other clinical characteristics of the disease, like the MIS uh, syndrome in children, uh, are different in the UK and uh, in US as compared to what we see in Asia. So there are characteristic differences but the fact that asthma is not a uh, major comorbidity of uh, COVID-19 is also uh, interestingly here. Well, we could also say that maybe the air pollution uh, with the lockdown, you're less exposed to pollution. Uh, these are different, different hypotheses. I'll come to that uh, in the next slides. Now, why is COVID-19 and asthma not a comorbid? This is a hypothesis. And this paper was again published in Allergy, We're very happy, led by my uh, colleague and president-elect, Professor Wang from Taiwan. And uh, uh, as you can see here, that what happens in SARS-CoV-2 infection, there is an increase because SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 receptor. And so there is an increase in the ACE2 receptor expression, TMP RSS2, increase IL-6 and TNF-alpha, increase inflammatory macrophages, more CD8 positive cytotoxic cells, lymphocytopenia, a cytokine storm. And basically there are inflammatory ma macrophages result in an aberrant antivirus immunity from the M0 type. In allergy, what happens is you have less ACE2 receptor. So if you have less ACE2 receptor and less TMPRSS2, there is less binding or less opportunity for the SARS-CoV-2 to bind to the ACE2 receptor. The other important point is MBL and SPD are surfactant proteins that compete with SARS-CoV-2 to bind to the ACE2 receptor. 
So these are also, these are increased in allergic uh, diseases and asthma. So these are already binding the ACE2 receptor, the less chance for the SARS-CoV-2 to again bind to the ACE2 receptor. And of course you have increased ILC2s, increased CD4 positive cells. And as I mentioned earlier, the patients are already probably taking many of them. We know that the compliance is better during this uh, COVID-19. So their inhaled corticosteroids or their biologics are actually uh, protecting them from uh, any uh, viral infection. So these are again postulations and not completely proven, but, but a very good reason uh, based on this kind of a mechanism. And here you get a trained immunity. Now, this again shows the same situation. Nasal epithelium, bronchial epithelium were exposed to IL-13. And you can see here in the presence of IL-13, you can see that the expression of ACE2 receptor is downregulated, clearly showing that this lower, this TS2 type of environment may play a role in downregulating the ACE2 receptor. Now, before I go a little bit onto the pollution and COVID-19, just try to show you our white paper, which again is published by our board and all our member countries that came together uh, because Asia Pacific actually is uh, takes a big brunt of what the climate change or air pollution and the, and the lack of biodiversity or reduced biodiversity in our region. So this has a huge impact on allergic diseases in our region. So it's too uh, uh, lengthy a paper. Uh, you could read it on, on the, the thing, but just trying to show you that across the different countries, you can see that this external uh, or outdoor pollutants like particulate matter or ozone or NO2 or vol volatile organic compounds plays an important role, but also household uh, or indoor pollutants like smoking are important and diesel exhaust particles. And as I, I I will not show today, but we know that diesel exhaust particle can upregulate the uh, expression of HLA-DR molecule on epithelial cells and on other cells, and thus increasing its uh, potentiality to actually uh, have a more inflammatory mechanism and uh, a more severe allergic phenomenon. And these are the other countries, including Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong. So across these different countries, these are the different studies that show very clearly the impact of air pollution on allergic diseases. So when we summarize this part of air pollution and respiratory allergies in our region in Asia Pacific, the top three countries for both asthma incidence and prevalence in Asia were India, China, and Indonesia, largely driven, of course, by the population size. Naturally, if this country is uh, highly populated, the numbers would be more. But nearly half of the estimated uh, um, ozone attributal and over half of them were due to PM 2.5, again attributed uh, to asthma emergency room visits were estimated in Southeast Asia, including India. For example, in winter in India, you can find that the schools are sometimes closed for three to four days because there's so much of smog and so much of pollution that, uh, that it causes severe atta attacks of asthma in children and schools have to be closed. Again, these uh, outdoor pollutions are causing uh, asthma emergency room visits and uh, the total air pollution in this uh, uh, area is quite high. And in addition to this, uh, Australia also is part of our region as Asia Pacific, the incidence of thunderstorm asthma is enough, especially also affecting the South Asian and Southeast Asian ethnicity is a huge uh, problem that is a result of climate change and a reduced biodiversity. Now, coming back to COVID-19 and air pollution, this is some data from Italy that shows that in the areas where there were high numbers of uh, COVID-19, that there was much more air pollution. Now, when the COVID-19 happened and there was a lockdown, the air was clear, you could see blue skies, you were seeing that could, of course, reduce the incidence of asthma attacks uh, itself. But COVID-19's prevalence and the prevalence of air pollution in those areas was very correlated in this particular study, showing that the PN2.5 concentration averaged over uh, the period of uh, Feb 15 uh, to 26, uh, 2020 for the 110 uh, provinces in Italy and the incidence of this showed 
a higher mortality rate, a higher case fatality rate over this period. So they summarized the key points is that there was a correlation between PM 2.5 and COVID-19, that there was a tripling of the infection rate for average PM 2.5 concentration levels, ranging from 10 to 22 microgram per cubic meter, that average PM 2.5 level was positively correlated also with the mortality rate, and also that the case fatality rate, that is the deaths to infection ratio, was also strongly dependent on PM 2.5. But this is a review that my uh, uh, colleague and intern wrote together with me um, and published in the current opinion of allergy and immunology. But she has taken data from different studies uh, and also what is uh, published uh, in uh, different journals. And what this actually shows is when you look at the different countries, you can see that some of these studies actually, or some of this data supports the fact that the air pollution could aggravate COVID-19, but others don't really. So it's still a matter of discussion and requires more studies to actually uh, understand it. But under the surges of COVID-19, I think protecting ourselves and getting out of this pandemic, vaccinating uh, everyone is the key issue. And so less uh, attention is paid towards these issues. So to summarize uh, my talk on um, uh, air pollution and airways disease. Epidemiological studies show that both indoor and outdoor pollutants affect respiratory health, including an increased prevalence of asthma and allergic diseases. Global warming will increase the effects of outdoor air pollution on health. The Asia Pacific is the most populated region in the world with a huge burden of both outdoor and indoor pollutants that I've already named like particulate matter, and household pollutants and ozone and uh, carbon monoxide and so on. And the risk factors for the epidemiological rise of allergic disease in Asia Pacific are largely due to the increased urbanization, um, the environmental uh, pollution, air pollution and climate changes that are occurring in recent decades in this region. So I don't know if these MCQs are to be asked now or later. Um, I just skip it and come to this um, part. And uh, I would like to end my talk by saying, I would like to welcome all of you to this Apache 2021 International Conference. This was supposed to be held in person in Kaohsiung uh, in Taiwan. Unfortunately, due to the recent surge of um, COVID in Taiwan, that was one of the countries that had almost no cases. Uh, we have moved this to a completely fully virtual uh, conference and uh, the abstract submission deadline is uh, actually the 15th of July. Please do uh, submit abstracts, there are educational grants available and there are oh, almost 100 speakers and a real galaxy of speakers that you can listen to. So don't miss the opportunity to attend this excellent meeting uh, 15th to 17th of October 2021. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, Ruby, hello? Yes, yes. Oh, that's a wonderful talk. May I have to ask you a question about that? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, data on the connection between the air pollution and uh, chronic rhinosinusitis? I well, know there are... You, pardon? You have a lot of data on the allergic rhinitis, but how about the chronic rhinosinusitis? Uh, there are studies that show that chronic rhinosinusitis is also aggravated by um, air pollution, but I think there has been more focus on allergic rhinitis, asthma, and COPD as compared to chronic rhinosinusitis. But definitely chronic rhinosinusitis uh, is affected by air pollution. I don't know if it specifically has any particular uh, pattern for, for those that are neutrophilic in nature or isnophilic in nature. I am not, I'm not really clear about that aspect. And the other important point is that um, besides uh, air pollution, uh, reduced biodiversity, which is something I did not address today, 
is part of like climate change, reduced bio reduced biodiversity also has an impact on uh, all the uh, chronic non-communicable diseases, which include, of course, uh, even chronic rhinocytes with nasal polyps, mm. which is more of an inflammatory uh, disease. Good. So uh, there's a question on a Dupli map. Do you want to answer that or, or I, I will do that? No, you can answer. Okay, there's a question. How often uh, to give Dupli map and for how long? So based on the literature, usually we can uh, inject a Dupli map every two weeks. So uh, usually uh, we can give it uh, uh, from 24 weeks to uh, 52 weeks. Is uh is Klaus on the this thing or maybe he's he has his clinic and had to leave or? Well, Klaus is missing obviously. Yeah, maybe he's uh, he has his clinic. I th I think so. Okay. Mm. So I mean, um, the other thing that I would uh, really um, uh, ask is like um, you know when you're talking about how often to give dipilimab, is um, dipilimab is also very effective in severe asthma, right? Mm -hmm. Right, And yes. also in urticaria. So uh, while it might be, a, um, when we talk about biologics, we talk about costs, but when we talk about the impact that they can have on a multi-organ disease, like someone having asthma and chronic rhinosinusitis or somebody having chronic uh, um, uh, urticaria and asthma, a uh, treatment like dipilimab, for example, would play uh, an important role. Do you have, have you looked at patients with asthma and chronic rhinosinusitis? Well, definitely, you know, in, the, in China, the insurance company only cover the patients with asthma and the chronic rhinosinusitis. So asthma is the first pri primary indication. So uh, if the patients want the insurance company cover the, 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 the expense, we have to give the, um, uh, uh, dupimab to the patients with both disease, actually. I see. So I'm just looking at, uh, uh, yeah, I can see. Uh, Ruby, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, how about diet? You know, for example, uh, the, the, in, you are living in Japan and China and uh, you, you're born in India. So India food, Chinese food and uh, uh, Japanese food are totally different. So do you think that the, the diet, the food have influence on the on the upper airway disease, uh, for example, allergic rhinitis and, uh, and uh, the chronic rhinosinusitis. I think you touched upon a very, very, very important topic because this goes far beyond just allergic rhinitis and chronic rhinosinusitis, but it actually touches all um, chronic non-communicable diseases and even maybe, maybe to some extent some communicable diseases too. Uh, what is what we really know is especially maternal nutrition and uh, early life nutrition play a very, very important role. So the kind of diet that we have at that stage, but also later on in life, like uh, with, for example, if you look at the prevalence of so many diseases that have increased in our region that were non-existent, we see the westernized kind of lifestyle, but also the westernized kind of foods coming in and changing the pattern of disease so much. When I came to Japan, we never saw so many children with food allergies. We never saw uh, children with peanut allergy. Now peanut mm -hmm. allergy is becoming so common in, in uh, Singapore, becoming common in Japan as compared to before. I'm not saying it's A the main one. one. Yes, so, this, so the diet plays a Im very important role. And I think nutrition itself is crucial and a balanced diet is, is very crucial. So one other thing that also um, uh, 
we have always thought, but we don't know. If you look at COVID-19 in general, I mean, I, we can see that in India now the cases are, um, you know, it's a different variant and then the disease severity is much more. But in general, otherwise, the severity of COVID-19 was so low, uh, so, I mean, much less in Asia as compared to what was seen in the West. Was it a diet? We don't know. We don't have the answer to it. But the only thing I can say uh, definitely that diet plays an important role in maintaining a healthy immune system and a gut uh, microbiome. And that the gut microbiome interacts with the brain microbiome and with other uh, microbiome, the skin and respiratory. And this kind of a balance is crucial uh, to prevent uh, uh, chronic diseases. Mm, good. That's a very good point. Yeah. And any, um, what I wanted to ask you is when we talk about the research areas, um, what research areas do you think are crucial for us uh, as a future research area? You know, what, what is the area that we need to, like unmet research needs? Well, currently, I think there's a there has been a lot of progress in the uh, in the pathophysiology of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or without nasal polyps. So we may look into the immunological mechanisms of the disease. We may understand the disease better, and we will develop more biologics to treat the disease, especially the refractory or difficult disease. So. I think the biologics just opening a new door for the treatment. I think just like the uh, we use uh, steroid, intranasal steroid, more than uh, 50 years ago, the nowadays is a biologic times. Um, uh, also, there's a difference between these two kind of drugs. Uh, the, the, for example, uh, remembering for the last uh, uh, 30, 40 years, the, the development of uh, of, of uh, intranasal uh, steroids is not that fast. Actually, we may have a, a, a new uh, intranasal steroids one by one. Every five to 10 years, we have a new drug. But for the biologics, suddenly there are three, five new ones coming out. And actually there's another five to 10 coming out also. So this developing uh, speed is very fast. I think we will we, we will be prepared for the new era. Thank you very much. I have a question here, which I mean, both of us can answer the because it's not targeted to uh, anyone in particular. It says, uh, "What are your views on the hygiene hypothesis?" And if I may say that, yes, uh, well, hygiene hypothesis when it started very early with a study in German look, uh, uh, looking Germany looking at uh, children exposed to farm milk and uh, uh, stable uh, the farm animals uh, were less atopic as compared to those who were uh, 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 not exposed. So from there there have been lots of studies uh, that have also shown the impact of uh, uh, the, the hygiene hypothesis being more relevant. Uh, but again, it's, it's like it's, uh, there are data that shows a different kind of a um, uh, balance, uh, but very clearly the hygiene hypothesis is based on the fact that early um, exposure to infection uh, builds up a Th1 kind of, of um, immunity which therefore uh, makes you less prone to develop allergic diseases. So um, uh, from, from that point of view, I would say that the hygiene hypothesis is one of the causes for the increase in allergies. Would you like to add something, uh, Lau? Well, I think uh, there's several uh, 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 theory to explain the, the, the mechanisms of uh, allergy. Uh, I think one of, the most important is hygiene hypothesis. There's others like uh, old friends hypothesis or recently uh, epithelium hypothesis. So there are uh, quite several ones, but I think uh, for hygiene hypothesis is the most popular one. Yes, thank you. There's one more question and I'd like to ask you to answer this because uh, this is part of your talk. 
the question is, what about immunosuppressive impact of biologics? I mean, whether biologics have any immunosuppressive effect? Well, I, I only touched the biologics a little bit. I think the, the, the Klaus should be the, 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 the optimal one to answer that question. But however, based on the current evidence, we don't see immunosuppressive effect of biologics when we treat the patients with chronic rhinosinusitis. Yeah, and I, I would agree on that because even uh, like omalizumab, is, which is there for even for ages, is been used for severe asthma and chronic urticaria. Then we have all the anti IL fives, and now we have dipilumab. There is no evidence of it having any immunosuppressive uh, effect as such. Yeah, maybe I can add one more comment. Uh, the longest period uh, of a treatment is one year, but after that, we don't know if this. Uh, is long enough to make a conclusion. But in the future, when we treat the patients with longer period, for example, two or three years, we may be in the position of answer that more uh, uh, correctly or clearly, I think. Thank you. I think this was a very, very excellent uh, session. And I really thank uh, Klaus and uh, Yu Lao uh, for making this uh, happen. This has really been um, very, very uh, important. This will be available on Apache TV also for people to see in case people have missed this live session. And uh, we thank all the audience for being there and for participating in it actively. And we look forward to meeting you in our future forums. And please, once again, we welcome you to the Apache Virtual 2021 meeting uh, Prof. Lau, who is uh, an executive committee and treasurer of Apache, together with me, we welcome you uh, for our Apache virtual conference, uh, October 15 to 17, 2021. And with this, I'd like to thank uh, our hosts who have hosted this meeting, uh, MCI, and also for our supporters, uh, Sanofi. Thank you very much. And to all the audience, a very good night and uh, stay safe, stay well, uh, God bless. And we'll come out of this. Uh, we all should get vaccinated and we'll come out of this and we will be able to meet in person. So with, with a spirit of hope and happiness, care, love and compassion, I'd like to conclude this session. Thank you, Ruby. Bye -bye. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night.